and honor you. We thank you for the privilege to stand once again in your presence this hour. Father Lord, it is not by power, it is not by mind. It is by your spirit. We ask, O oh Lord, divine wisdom from you. Understanding to live a God-fearing life. A life worthy of emulation. Father, the hour has come again that we gather together once a week to hear from you, to know what you have in store for us throughout the coming week. Father, teach us your word. Write your law upon our hearts. Guide us with wisdom. With the help of your Holy Spirit, empower us for breakthrough tonight. Lord, we ask that you teach us with wisdom. We ask that you teach us with knowledge. We ask, O oh Lord, that man understanding be downgraded and your spiritual understanding be elevated in our life. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, you are welcome again to this Open Heart Fellowship where we use opportunity to hear from the Lord and understand what the Lord has in store for us. Today we have another teaching which says that being sanctified being sanctified is a teaching that I have always loved to teach because what we learn as believers is that without the shedding of blood there is no remission for sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Sin can only be repurposed for good if the blood of the intercessor is shed. And that is the reason why today we have confidence in the death of Christ because he shared his blood so that we don't have to share ours and he saved us from the eternal wrath of sin and through his blood we have boldness to come to the throne of grace to ask God for help in our time of difficulties today we are happy once again in this open house fellowship Open House Fellowship is opportunity in CGF where we gather together once a week to fellowship together. Today we call it Training the Trainer, where we prepare missionaries who are currently serving and ministers for, of the gospel to be equipped with the right knowledge and with the word of God to carry them to their various field. And in this class, we believe that iron sharpens iron. So does the man sharpen the countenance of his brother. We do not expect to know it all. If you have questions or concern in our teaching, our links and our telephone number are below the video. You can write, call, and send a message to us on WhatsApp concerning your prayer requests, your intercessory or your concern about our teaching and we will modify it to fit the scriptures that explain your very perspective and if there is a place where you have concern or you have done your own research in the scriptures and found out that you were not clear about what we teach we advise that you send us message on whatsapp or Go to our website and leave a comment. We will respond to your message by repeating that particular teaching just for you. And so that we can spend time to digest that particular view where you have concern. Brethren, today we have another exciting teaching. But before we start, I want you to understand that when we say iron sharpened iron, it takes a man to sharpen the countenance of his brother. No man is an island of knowledge. And that's why today we expect 
your understanding. We want you to write to us about what you have about today's teaching, your concern, or something you don't understand about today's teaching. And if you have such message, please leave it for us. Today we are having another exciting topic. We said being sanctified. In Christianity, sanctification, sanctification is a requirement and a must if we must see God. The Bible says, without holiness, no man can see the Lord. And if you wish to see God on the last day, or when you depart this physical earth, you need to be sanctified. Sanctification is not just a requirement. It's a must in Christianity. And that's why, as believer, sanctification is not a topic we take lightly. We teach sanctification with all sincerity and with all purpose. What is sanctification? That's our first point for today. What is sanctification? Sanctification is when you are declared holy. When you are declared holy. Because believe, as believer, there came a times in your life when you have accepted salvation. You have already come to Christ by confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And God welcomed you into a new family of the sons of God. And now you, your sin, you need remission from sin with the precious blood of Christ. The Bible said without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The blood of Christ was shed on the cross of Calvary to purify you and to redirect you from the path of destruction to the path of life. Today, we celebrate God's greatness and divine favor upon our life. We ask that not only did you hear this word, but let it sink in and understand the purpose why believers need to be sanctified in their day-to-day -day life. Because a sanctified believer can stand tall in the midst of his enemy, can rejoice in the camp of defeat, when failure parades Christians' life, only the sanctified can boldly come to the throne of grace and ask God for help when they are in time of need. It takes sanctification to approach to God. Throughout the Old Testament, we discover how the few that know their God, they were strong and they were able to do exploits. Because we understand it from the scripture that the righteous are as bold as a lion. But there's something you need to understand about the wicked. The wicked flew when no man pursued him. The reason why the wicked flew is because of fear. Fear that their sin will be found out. Fear that their evil deed will be discovered by those whom they harm. And as a result, their life is full of fear. Today, before we digest this teaching on sanctification, I want us to take a reflection from the scripture. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, what is said from verse 1. So today we shall be studying Hebrews 10 from chapter 1, from verse 1 to 14. And it says, For the Lord having a shadow of good thing to come, not the very image of the thing, can never, with a sacrifice which was offered year by year continually, make the Comma, we are for perfect. Let's get it straight. Yes, a lot of Christians parade a message today. They tell you once you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Nobody is disputing that. That is true. The day you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. At that point in time, if anything happens to you, you will perhaps be with the Lord in the bosom of the Father. But let's Digest. Why therefore do we still need to go further and be sanctified mm. if by accepting Christ we are saved? Remember, the purpose of the death of Christ was to remove the nature of sin from us. The nature of sin. Because 
if you are being honest to yourself since you've been born again, you discover that the old self, some part of it, some has been taken away, but some part of it still lives in you. For example, the fact you say, yes, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, Life does not just suddenly disappear from your mouth. If you are a murderer, you still remain a murderer. If you are a thief, you still remain a thief. And if you are whatever, you still remain on that particular path until a time in your life that you received the refreshing from the Holy Spirit. When there is a transformation of character and when the fruit of God begins to set in. And this is where loss dies away in your life. And this starts in phases. The first phase of sanctification is the feel of guilt. Maybe you are a habitual liar before you were saved. And now you are saved. Before you speak, you find lie proceed. And instantly you feel guilty because this was something you were doing at a habit before you were saved. But now, as a believer, this habit has developed to what we call shame, fear, doubt, confusion, and feeling of guilt. And because of this guilt, you knew that the guilty will not escape. And this guilt makes you to fall on your knees every day. When you wake up and you say, Father, forgive me, for I know I have sinned. Things I said that we do not got to do since I have accepted Christ, I still find myself doing it. And that's what Paul was referring to in the book of First Corinthians. When he said, the good I want to do, I find myself doing the opposite. But the evil I hate to do, I find myself doing it. Who will save me from this burden of sin? And that question was answered in sanctification. Because the body of sin needs to be destroyed. Because the Bible says without righteousness or without holiness, no man living on earth will see the Lord. So how therefore can we see God if after we have confessed Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the sin we are running for still parade upon our life. The guilt of things we hate, we still find ourselves doing exactly the same thing. Who will not save us from this body of sin? How therefore can we see God? If without holiness no man can see the Lord, how can we boldly come to the throne of grace? If sin is the author and the finisher of our strength, even after we have accepted Christ, how can we now boldly come to God in time of need and ask, Father, please help me? There is no possible for us because the Bible says, says to the righteous it is well with thee how can it be well with unbeliever and sinner because the bible said the soul that sinned shall die and you knew that that's why you have been saved from sin if you go back again into captivity there remained no blood for sacrifice now therefore how do i free myself from going back to the things i hate from the things i don't want to do that i found myself doing how do I deliver myself from the enmity that lives in the flesh? Because the flesh was taken from the dust. And that's why God, one of the curse God placed on man in Genesis was that dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. And thus weakened the nations. Because of the dust which we are, weakness is paraded in our veins. Therefore, how can we be purified? How can we be sanctified? Is it by struggling under the law? We knew how the law, even Moses, the law came through Moses. Not even Moses could save himself from the law. And that tells you that the Lord cannot make any man righteous. And what the, the scripture says, cause is any man that continue not in everything that is written in the book of the law. And you and I know it is not possible to continue in everything that is written in the law. How possible is it for you to keep the whole law? Remember what the scripture said, if any man keep the whole law and yet offend it in one point, he shall be guilty of all the laws. 
now now we know that with our power and with our trying to live a righteous life and there is a place that really gets me in the scriptures it said all our righteousness are a fading rank before god that means there is no human effort or anything we do on earth that can make us holy we cannot by our own strength become holy it doesn't matter how hard we try but what shall we do therefore now let's get to the scripture to understand that even during the time of moses they knew they needed holiness they needed sanctification they needed purity they don't know how first was to offer animals every year for the sanctification of sin to sprinkle the blood upon the altar to sprinkle the blood upon the congregation and to let all the people sin in a scapegoat and send him into the wilderness but this could not take away sin all he does was cover sin and remember what the scripture says to us he that covered his sins will not prosper and i want to prosper i don't want to end up like the children of israel who though their father was promised the the land of promise the land flowing with milk and honey many of them never saw it but that is not how i want to end up as a child of god i want to go beyond those sacrifices and beyond those limits therefore in verse 2 he make us understand that they would not have ceased to offer those sacrifices if those sacrifices actually worked the reason why it ceased is because it doesn't work because any man that has been once sanctified or once purged from sin with the blood of goat or sheep should have been once and for all sanctified he would have not need to kill a goat the next year but there is a problem this blood of goat and bull could not take away sin it could not make the offender clean what if god says to the children of israel i have no delight in your sacrifice in sacrifice other than obedience to his law god has no delight in sacrifice god wants you to obey what he is saying to obey is better than sacrifice to hearken than the fatness of ram but if god is not interested in any of our sacrifice what then shall we do now he said in verse 5 offering thou wouldest not but a body that has prepared me god prepared a body that was sinless free from sin and even by Satan's own conviction he claimed that Christ was an innocent man and Judah when Satan entered into Judah to betray him when Judah realized that he has betrayed his master he went back to the chief prince and said to them take back your money because i have betrayed an innocent blood that means by own Satan's own conviction christ was declared innocent so he was innocent of guilt and sins free from adamic nature and because he obtains baptism as we all have that means the sin that adam children inherited he was not he did not share in it now because of that he was prepared from the beginning he was on earth like we are tested in every way as we should but he was found without sin now was any guilt found in his hand in verse 6 he made it clearer to us that in burnt offering and sacrifice for sin that has no pleasure god is not interested in covering sin because he knew that as long as you cover sin you will not prosper and he wants his children to prosper 
And he made it clearer to us in verse 7 that I said, Lo, I come in the volume of that book. Obedience is better than sacrifice to hearken than the fatness of a ram. Taking an easy way out doesn't help solve problems. To obey to God is far better than sacrificing a ram. Today we have Christians who would rather give 10 million to church rather than to do the right thing. It is easier for them to tell the pastor, don't worry, I'll build you a new cathedral. Rather than fulfill the royal laws according to the scripture. To love your enemy as yourself. And to love your neighbor as yourself as well. Now, in verse 8, above when he said, sacrifice and offering, and burnt offering, and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither have thou pressure therein, which are offered by the law. God is not interested in the offering of the law. God does not want a believer to live a life of big daily confession, 30 minutes confession. What if you die before you say, Father, forgive me? What would that leave you? God wants us to be sanctified. God wants us to live a life free from sin. Where nothing is holding us back. Where we can boldly come to the throne of grace and ask God for help in time of need. That is the life God wanted for us. But is this life possible? We have seen Christians over the century who argue that sanctification is not possible. And I want to stand on the contrary part of that argument. If sanctification is not possible, that means the death of Christ is in vain. That means Christ's death is in vain. If Christians cannot become holy, what is the point of Christ dying? If Christ died, so that you can be declared righteous and you cannot be righteous then his death is nothing to us christ's death was to bring holiness transparency and purity into the world but the time as a believer you now says well there is no righteousness that means the blood of Christ was never shed. And if the blood of Christ was never shed, that means you are still in your sin. That means everybody that have died before us, they perish. And that means the apostles and everybody that was sown asunder, thrown into the lion den, they died in vain. And that means the dead rise not. And if the dead rise not, that means you are still in your sin. Now, let's get it clear, O oh, men of little faith. Let's get clarity. The only reason why you and I can be called Christians is because of sanctification. Because without sanctification, there is no fruit of the Spirit. And without the fruit of the Spirit, there is no Christianity. Christianity is not made up of the four corner world or the dove or the dome on top of each cathedral. Christianity is made up by the conduct of the people that stand before those walls. What is a church? A church is the Holy Spirit embodied in the life of a believer to live a victorious holy life where the Spirit of God worship. That is the church. We are God's church. Built into a spiritual house. In Christ Jesus. If therefore we now say to ourselves, well, it is not possible for me to be sanctified. That means we just say to ourselves, God, sorry, our life is no longer hidden in you. Our life cannot be saved. We are doomed.
him from the beginning. God would not have killed a lamb in Genesis if he knew that the lamb blood and his covering could not cover man from sin. If the skin of the lamb cannot be used for covering, God would have left us with feet leaf by which we cover ourselves. The reason why the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world well, because God himself believed that the blood and the skin of the lamb can cover us. And therefore, it is possible for believer to be sanctified. And that is the will of God for your life. And that is the will of God for my life. When we talk about sanctification, we are talking about the action of declaring someone as holy or declaring someone as a saint because when we use the word declaring someone as a saint a lot of believers believe that saints are only named when they die but that's not true we have living saints sanctification is the process of being declared holy declared purified declared virtuous and that is sanctification. But God said we can attain that limit in Christianity. We can get to the level of sanctification. We can be declared a saint while living on earth. We can be declared righteous, perfect before God. We can be ready to see Him any time, any day when He comes. So, how possible is because somebody has showed that it is possible. Christ did not live in an alternate reality world. He lived in our world today. In his day, there were politicians. In his days, there were liars. In his days, there were aristocrats. In his days, they were betrayers. He was betrayed by his best friend. And he was sold in the house of his friend. So, there is nothing we go through today that he did not go through. He was tested when he was hungry to convert God-given power for his own financial benefits. Today, a lot of Christians will do it. But Christ never did. Christ was tempted to use the power of God to make himself satisfied with earthly goods, feed himself with food, made himself king in the world. Do you really think if today pastors were tempted by the devils to use the power of God to make themselves president, they would not do it. Or to use the power of God to feed their family, they will not do it. Christ was not satisfied when he was tempted. Christ does not have chain of business when the devil tempted him to use the power of God to feed his stomach. He was hungry. He was at his weakest point in life when he has been with God for 40 days and 40 nights. He has ate nothing. He was tasty. He was hungry. But yet, you understand that abusing the power of God for financial gain is going to destroy what Christianity stands for. He understood making himself escape the cross. There is no shortcut to God's favor. He understood that. He took the hard way. But something else he did. He understands that he doesn't mean to show God power to the people. That men will surely come to the glory of God. The Bible says on the last day, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be higher and lifted up. 
that all nation of the earth will flow to it. Indeed, all nations will flow to it. But Christ would have taken the easy way out. He never did. Just as you should not. Take the long, painful ways to be sanctified. Follow hard after the word of God. We read there in the book of Hebrew that Christ came to obey the will of God. He came to fulfill the scriptures. Nothing will please God more than to fulfill your callings in the life that he has called you to do. Fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures. Nothing will please God more than that. That was what Christ did. He followed the volume of the book as it was written. He did not make his own laws. But what then he, he said, Lo, I come in the volume of that book as it is written of me to do thy will, O God, doing the will of God. Have the Lord any delight in sacrifice other than obedient to his will? Has the Lord any delight in sacrifice or burnt offering than to be obedient to his will? And I tell you, to obey to God is better than sacrifice. To hearken to his voice and do what he sent you to do is most preferable to him than the fatness of a ram. And then, in verse 8, he said, above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt sacrifice and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither wouldest not, neither have thou pleasure therein, which offered by the Lord. Then said he in verse 9, Lord, I come to do thy will, O Lord, as it is written of me, that he may establish, take away the first and establish the second. What was the first? Sacrifice of the law, according to the laws of Moses. The things, let's go to, let's understand the sacrifice of the laws. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 8 from verse, we will still come back to our, the book of Hebrew to understand it better. Leviticus, I will read from verse 9. What did it say in verse 9? He said, he puts a mistress upon his head. And upon the mitre, even upon the forefront, did he put the golden plates and the holy crown as the Lord commanded Moses. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anoint the altars and all his verses both levers and his suits to sanctify them he pour off the anointing oil upon arrowhead and anoint him to sanctify him and moses brought hero son and put coat upon them and guided them with a guide and put bonnet upon them as the Lord has commanded Moses. He brought the bullock for the sin offering, and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering, and he threw he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horn of the altar, and upon which around about with his finger and purified the altar 
and pour the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctify it to make a reconciliation for it. Now, we just see what Moses did to sanctify the altars in the Old Testament. But God is saying to you, those sacrifices of blood, sanctifying the altars, he has no delight in. Because Moses did sacrifice of goats, ram, bullock, upon the altar. And God has made it clear to us that he will not eat the flesh of a goat, nor drink the blood of his wine. God is not interested in sacrifice because the goats of the thousand hills, they are his. The beasts of the forest, they are all his. If he were hungry, he would not tell us. He will go into the forest and take whatever he wants. But he's saying to us, obedience to him is better than sacrifice. But this New Testament was established by a different code of conduct, a different law, a different set of rules. And what was this rule? <coughs> In Hebrew 10, we understand that this rule was far different from the rule set by Moses. Because he says in verse 10, by which all we certify through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Instead of killing bull and ram every year, the blood of the only begotten Son of God was offered upon the altars of sacrifice once and for all. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so was the Son of Man lifted up. That whoever looked upon him would not be ashamed. Today we have sanctification by having confidence in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. And it is only his blood that can purify you. Whenever sin becomes a stain in your life that refuses to be washed, touch the hem of his garments. Let the blood do this magic and purify you and sanctify you. It is not by power. It is not by mind. It is by the Spirit. Try to understand the rational cleansing of the blood. It's a waste of time. Just like in the Old Testament, sprinkling the blood of goats or sheep or bull upon a man cannot, it's not sprinkled upon his heart. That means the sin is still in the heart. The wickedness is still in the heart. The abomination is still in the heart. But with the blood of Jesus, which is we speak better things than the blood of Abel. It can sprinkle the hearts. It can sprinkle the authors. It can sprinkle the mind. It can sprinkle your conscience. It can transform a habit. The worst thing to be transformed is habit. But the blood of Christ can kill a habit. And can transform it. And that's why your sin can be remission for holiness. God that brings light out of darkness is still able to bring good things out of your evil mind. God that brings goodness out of emptiness is able to take your empty life story and transform it to good things. And that's what he's telling you today. That without the shedding of blood, sin cannot be repurposed. And for sin to be repurposed in your life for goodness, you need the blood of Christ. 
that was shared 2,000 years ago for the remission of sin. There is no other sacrifice that is required. The blood was shed. But now the questions remain. Christ died 2,000 years ago. His blood is not on reserve today. Where do I get the blood to wash my sin? Confident in his blood. Having faith in his death. And that is what is being born again. Confidence in his death. Resurrection. And ascension. When you have faith in it, it doesn't matter your leaning, your religious leaning, your com your doubt or whatever. But as long as you believed from the heart and you are ready to confess him from your mouth before multitude of witnesses, God will send you into a season of reflection. And that opportunity will change your life forever. That means it is very possible to obtain certification. Even in today's world of sin, where the devil is the God of this world. That means the will of God can still be obtained, which is your sanctification. This sanctification, though it's a wide range of topics, which I may not be able to cover today. But I want you to understand something about God's purpose for sanctifying us. The book of Hebrew 10. He makes us understand in verse 10 that Christ, by that by that which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. Now he said, Lo, I come to do thy will as O God. He has taken away the first laws, which is the laws of Moses, that he may establish the second law. Because we understand from the book of Romans that the law brings memory of sin. That I will not know what fornication is. I said the Bible said, Thou shalt not fornicate. I will not know what adultery is. I said the Bible said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. I will not know what murder is. I said the Bible said, Thou shalt not kill. And because those laws were written, they bring the memory of sin to our knowledge. And this memory sticks to our brain. Every year there is a constant remembrance of it, remembrance of sin. And that's why Christ came, so that the conscience of sin can be destroyed. And Christ now, instead of thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not do this, Christ bring one law, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, all other laws are fulfilling this. And the first law was, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the second is fulfilled in it, which thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And when you do this, you do right. And the Bible says, love triumph over judgment. Because he that love his neighbor, we do no harm. And the Lord is saying to you that if you show mercy to all that the Lord also will show you mercy. Does it mean sin no longer exists? It do exist. But the Bible says as long as we forgive people easily that sin against us, God is ready to forgive us our sin. So, that means we can be holy. Yes, we can be holy. We can be purified. And it doesn't take any effort. We don't need to struggle to do it. But we have to hunger for it. We have to taste for it. We have to long for it. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 5, that blessed are those who hunger and taste for righteousness. For they shall be fed. Are you hungry? Are you hungry for righteousness? Are you hungry to be holy? Are you hungry and thirsty for it? God is going to fill you with it tonight. God is going to put his laws into your mouth. 
and is going to write his laws in your heart that you don't need to write it upon your doorpost anymore because it's going to be written on top of the table of your heart, the fleshly table of the heart. And God is saying to you right now, in verse 12, let's start from 11. He said, every prince taking, every prince standard daily ministry and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. Sorry for error. Error was there busy in the temple every day offering sacrifice to take away the sin of the children of Israel. But what happened to the rest of the world? Their sin remained. And those sins of the children of Israel was not taken away as a result of those sacrifices. Verse 12, but, the, but this man, he only need one sacrifice. He didn't need 10. He didn't need 20. He didn't need every day of sacrifice forever. He didn't need to be crucified every week. He didn't need to be killed every Sunday. But what happened? This man, with, when he had offered one sacrifice, not two, not three, not hundred, one sacrifice for sin forever. One sacrifice for sin forever. Not only now, but forever. He sat on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting his enemy to be made his full stone. Who is this enemy? The enemy he died on his account, sin and death. What did sin bring to us? The wages of sin is death. So God is waiting patiently for death to be defeated. And that's why he's sitting at the right hand of God, waiting for death to be put under his footstool. And then shall we then have authority to be able to speak face to face with death and say, Death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? Because the sting of death is sin, and the sting of sin is the law. And the law was swallowed up by the death of Christ. And now that Christ is waiting for his enemy to be made his full stop. 14. For by one offering he has made us perfect. One offering for sin. We can be perfect. God said, be ye perfect, because I, the Lord your God, am a perfect God. That means perfection is possible in Christianity. God wants us to be perfect, because he is a perfect God. There is no error in him. There should be no error in us. And for we to be perfect, we have to be crotted with a perfect Savior. So, today, what do we take away from today's teaching? For we to be perfect, we need to be clothed with the perfect Savior. It doesn't take labor. It doesn't take hard work. It doesn't take looking another way when you see sin in the streets. All it takes is cover yourself with the perfect Savior. That is the only way to be perfect. Because God is perfect. If you must be perfect, cover yourself with the perfect Savior. Put on Christ. If you put on Christ, you will be perfect. Because one sacrifice is enough. You don't need to go back to heaven to bring Christ down. So that he can come and die again for your sin, so that your sin can be forgiven. You don't need to descend into hell to raise Christ up from the grave. So that he can rise up and take your prayers to God. But what does he say? Faith in his death. Faith in his resurrection. Faith in his suffering. Faith. 
that I may comprehend that which I was comprehended. Faith in his death. Having confidence in his death. And that is what makes me a believer. I am not a believer because I go to church. I am a believer because I have confidence in the death of Christ. I believe I am not saved because of my work or by my labor. If not, I have something to boast about. But by grace am I saved through faith. That is not of myself. It is the gift of God, not of work, lest I should boast. Take the gift of God. To obtain holiness. In the book of Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen, he said, "Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is therefore what a new creature. That means." Christ is able to transform our character. For you that think, oh, I have a drinking habit, I have a drug habit, I cannot, I don't see the changes. Oh, some people will say, don't worry, you don't need to take drug anymore, take tobacco, or take this thing. God can make you stop. God is saying to you that if you are in Christ, you can be a new person. That means old habits are passed away. And behold, everything has become new. There is newness in Christ. Christ is the only no quality that can change the habit. No other person can. In the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 11, what did it say? And such were so less Read from verse 9. He said, Now know ye not that the unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicator, nor idolaters, nor adulterer, nor infeminate, nor abuser of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkard, nor reviler, nor extortioner shall inherit the kingdom of God. But such were all of us. But we are washed. How were we washed? By the blood. We were not washed by water. We were washed by the blood. But ye are sanctified. Sanctification comes from the word purified with the blood. But we are justified through the Holy Spirit and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That is where our sanctification comes from. That's why we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's why we can boldly come to the throne of grace. That's why we can stand and say, Habba Father. And when we say Habba Father, the Spirit testifies that this is indeed my Son. The Son of God. And as a Son, therefore I am here. And I joined here with Christ. Therefore I can boldly come to the throne of grace and ask for God help in time of difficulties, in time of need. And what did he say further? He said in verse 11, Such were some of us, but we are now washed by his spirit. Finally, the 12. All things are lawful unto me now. Everything is lawful to me. But all things are not experienced. Not all things I must do. Though all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient for me to do. All things are lawful for me, but not I will not be brought under the power of anything. 
13. Meat is for the belly, and the belly is for meat, but God will destroy both of them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God has both raised up the Lord, and we also raise us up by His power. So my body is not for fornication. So is your body. Your body should be for the Lord, not for fornication. Now, finally, we we'll read the book of John. Then we close for today. John 17, from verse 17. I read, Sanctify them through thy truth, and thy word is what? Truth. It takes the truth of the word of God to bring sanctification. If you are the kind of Christian who is looking for people that will tell you what you will hear, you can never be sanctified. It takes the truth to be sanctified. Brethren, before we close, I want to use this opportunity to thank you once again. Join us at the end of August from 24th to 25th for our oncoming mission conference in Uppsala. Try and make us understand your questions and answers, send it to us. You can write to us if you have any concern. Brethren, we also want you to understand that God is not a respecter of person. God is not the government. When you have